Welcome and good afternoon. I'm Dr. Johan, faculty member in Morono, the Roanoke College Chemistry Department, and I'm Director of Health Professions Advising on campus. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the first NOAC Live event of 2021. The NOAC Live series, created this past summer by the Roanoke College alumni, excuse me, Excuse me for that. The, the NOAC Live series created this past summer by the Roanoke College Alumni Association has produced 20 events to date on a myriad of, to myriad of topics ranging from film and book reviews to webinars on COVID, economics, politics, and more. It's a pleasure to be here today to host today's NOAC Live event. Before we get started, please know that each of you viewing via YouTube can use the chat feature to ask questions of our presenter. Once the presentation is complete, we will attempt to answer as many of your questions as possible. Today's event is being recorded and will be available on this YouTube channel for future viewing. A link to all past NOAC Live events as well as other online content can be found on the Alumni Hub at www.roanoke.edu slash alumni. Today's, today's NOAC Live event is a first in the series with a focus on science. Today, we will narrow in with a look at treatments for end-stage heart disease. We are joined by our guest, Dr. Jared Herr. Dr. Herr is a 2004 graduate of Roanoke College, where he majored in biochemistry and biology. He earned honors in those majors through his research with Dr. Jorgensen on the American lobster. After leaving us, he went on to earn his MD with honors at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. He did his residency in internal medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, followed by fellowships in cardiovascular disease and advanced heart failure and transport cardiology at the Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Dr. Herr has formal training in medical education through the UCSF Health Professions Educators Pathway, and he is an assistant clinical professor of medicine at UC San Francisco and the Dartmouth Giesel School of Medicine. He is actively engaged in medical education within the Sutter Health System and CPMC. He is the medical director of the Continuing Medical Education Program at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, and serves as the program director of the Advanced Heart Failure and Transplant Cardiology Fellowship. He has been recognized for his commitment to teach through to education and was awarded the Teacher of the Year uh, Award by the Cardiology Fellowship Program in 2018. His research efforts include studying patterns of patient referrals to advanced heart failure centers, remote hemodynamic monitoring, heart failure pharmaceutical drug trials, and heart transplant rejection monitoring. These are all super interesting topics, and I'm really tempted to ask him to speak to my class later in the year. As you'll gather from his engaging presentation, he is also an advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologist. He's practicing at the Sutter Health CPMC Center for Advanced Heart Failure Therapies. While we can't see you right now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jared Herr. Well, thank you, Dr. Johan. It's really a, a pleasure to be here today and have the opportunity to share with the Roanoke community a little bit about um, everything that I get an opportunity to do. And so I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen and, and presentation here. And um, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm really just very pleased in, and to have this opportunity and honored, honestly, to, to be the first uh, in line here for our series to highlighting folks who are alumni from the science programs. So as Dr. Johan mentioned, we're gonna talk a little bit about what I get to do every day, which is helping treat patients who have end-stage heart failure. We think about the causes of death in the United States, you know, constantly at the top of the list is heart disease, right? And if you look at in 2019, the amount of patients that died, the amount of people that died from uh, heart disease, you know, numbered over 600,000. Um, and this number has been consistent over the past number of years, although it's decreased to some degree, but it still remains and has been the number one cause of death for many, many years. And so what's good about the fact that there's been a major focus on treating heart disease is that we've done a really good job with managing uh, chronic uh, cardiovascular conditions and our patients are living longer and so forth um, because of these medical advances. However, um, because of that, we are starting to see uh, a rise in a population of patients who have chronic heart failure because of that. 
heart failure really, unfortunately, is an epidemic. And you might ask the question first, sort of what is heart failure to begin with? And heart failure is simply the heart's inability to provide the support that the body needs. Now that can become in two different forms. So either that the heart is weakened and the heart can't pump strong enough in order to provide blood flow to the rest of the body, or perhaps the heart is stiffened in some way and is unable to, uh, to provide the output that the heart, that the rest of the body needs as well. But there are many, many people who suffer from heart failure in this country. You know, around six and a half million Americans have heart failure. And every year we're seeing more than 600,000 uh, patients get diagnosed with heart failure every year. And it's projected that by the time we hit 2030, which is really not all that long ago now, or long from now, um, one in 33 people will actually have heart failure. And again, this is uh, largely related to the fact that we're better at taking care of patients who had cardiovascular conditions that would have otherwise killed them before. It is a huge burden on the medical system. We have over a million hospitalizations every year uh, related to heart failure, and it is actually the number one reason for hospitalization for patients who are over the age of 65. And because of that, we spend a significant amount of money taking care of patients who have heart failure. We spend over $30 billion a year in healthcare expenditures and almost $2 billion a year just simply taking care of patients in the office. A lot of the expenditures related to hospitalizations, and it's projected that we'll hit 50 billion um, again by 2030 as well. So it's really a significant drain on the medical system. And unfortunately, heart failure is a progressive condition. Um, back in 2013, the American Heart Association came out with a uh, staging system, basically looking at sort of um, the uh, progression of this disease in patients. Um, starting at sort of those folks who are in stage A, which are just to have conditions that put them at risk for developing heart failure. These are people who have things like hypertension or have uh, diabetes, um, but have yet, uh, yet to determine, have yet to develop any kind of a structural heart disease, that would take them into stage B. But it's really when patients develop symptoms from their heart failure that things start to take a turn for the worse. And moving between stage B and stage D, there's a, a significant decline in the one year uh, life expectancy of people who have this condition. And you can see it goes from in the 90s down to the mid 70s. And when folks, unfortunately, there's a certain portion of them, about five to 10% of them that actually develop refractory heart failure or end stage heart failure. And the survival after one year is very, very poor in those patients. Only one, uh, only 20% of patients are uh, going to live at a year, um, uh, fall into that category. But what's fortunate is that we have really good medications for patients who have chronic heart failure. And, you know, we've come a long ways in the last 20 or 30 years uh, in regards to this. We have uh, lots of medications that we can give people um, to try and help improve their, their um uh, quality of life, also keep them out of the hospital and improve their survival. So there are really sort of three, now really four classes of medications that we use um, to manage patients who have chronic heart failure. And all of them have had, you know, consistent tried and true improvement in patient outcomes. And so we are uh, really uh, fortunate to have these types of medications for people. We have other sort of special uh, treatments, things like defibrillators, which protect against heart rhythm problems that may have caused sudden death in patients, and we can improve their outcome um, in that way as well. Also, when the heart is weakened, um, the electrical system of the heart gets kind of out of whack and the heart becomes non, uh, uh, not coordinated anymore in its ability to contract. And so we've developed something car called cardiac resynchronization therapy, where it's actually a special kind of pacemaker that takes the heart from being, um, you know, having one side of the heart contract before the other side and putting it back together in a synchronized, uh, synchronized fashion. We have ways to help treat leaky valves or, you know, narrow valves in patients as well that don't require heart surgery. Um, so the, the sort of area of um, valve intervention that doesn't require heart surgery has really grown, um, particularly in this population, because often heart surgery is, is far too high risk in patients who have heart failure or traditional surgeries. And so we now have percutaneous options to try and help uh, repair uh, leaking valves or replace uh, narrow or leaky valves as well. And we also have ways to monitor people um, at home, making sure that we are optimizing their medications, keeping them out of the hospital. And one of the ways that we do that is through something called remote hemodynamic monitoring. This allows us to really sort of dive into the physiology of the heart and heart failure um, in patients who are you know, not in the office all the time. We use um, uh, hemodynamics uh, or the, basically the pressure um, inside the heart and lungs to kind of optimize patients' uh, medical treatments and sort of also assess how sick they are. Um, fortunately, now we have technology that allows us actually to do that at home through an implanted device, uh, which is called a CardiMAPS. But unfortunately, despite all these advances that we have and all these fancy techniques and medications that we've got, heart failure continues to progress and um, eventually becomes um, uh, progressive to an end stage. Um, what we see as patients become symptomatic is that 
they're more likely to end up in the hospital and their survival drops off pretty considerably. And so you see the top graph here, something called New York Heart Association functional class. And so it's class, classified as class one through four, one being no symptoms at all, and four being symptoms at rest, three being symptoms with limited activity. And so when you start to see that patients really start to develop class three or class four heart failure, that they do significantly worse. And unfortunately, and I think it's it's good to think about um, heart failure in this uh, in this sense because I, I think it's very concrete for a lot of people to sort of think of terms of cancer, right? And if you think of pancreatic cancer, there's about an 85% mortality at one year, right? And unfortunately, it's about the same as patients who have end-stage heart failure. It's about 80% uh, mortality at one year. So it's really um, once it progresses to this um, level, is um, uh, has a very poor prognosis. So we have to think about how does this happen? How do we take care of these patients? And uh, fortunately, we've developed a lot of uh, really good treatments um, for this population as well. So what are our treatment options for patients who have advanced heart failure or what we call, um, for that's the term we use for end-stage heart disease. The thing that everybody hears about is heart transplantation, and we'll talk about that today. Um, in the last 10 to 15 years, something called mechanical circulatory support has really taken hold um, as a treatment alternative to transplant or to buy people time to get a transplant. This is basically a surgical technique where we implant uh, pumps that do the work of the heart. They take blood out of the heart and pump it to the body um, and uh, restore normal blood flow to the body. But also almost equally as important, I think for patients is also to think about palliative care and hospice. Um, unfortunately, when folks have um, you know, end-stage disease, again, when thinking about things you know, equivalent to you know, advanced cancers, um, thinking about kind of quality of life uh, focus uh, therapy is, is equally important. And so, you know, I, as, a, as a, a transplant cardiologist, I look at all three of these options for each individual patient and try and, um, you know, figure out what is the best one, knowing that they're all, you know, equivalently good options for, for certain people. So in terms of heart transplantation, we've been doing heart transplants for a number of years, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But, you know, the number of heart transplants, unfortunately, hasn't really changed that much over the last uh, number of years. It's really only the last few years that we've seen an increase in the number of heart transplants done in the United States. Um, previously, we had done about 2,500 heart transplants in the U.S. pretty much every year, you know, for about 20 years. And just in, since 2016, have we seen an increase in that. And we're, we're hitting about 3,500 heart transplants across the country um, at this point. But still, you know, in thinking about it in comparison to the number of people who need transplants, significantly lower than those who get transplant. Um, but unfortunately, we have to think about novel ways to try and, and increase the number of uh, transplants that we can uh, do for people. But those who do get transplants do excellent. You know, this is again, a therapy that's been around for a long time and we have very good long-term data looking at patients who get transplant. And although it sounds like a big scary thing and, and it is to some degree, patients do really, really well. If you look at the median survival after transplants about 10 or 11 years, and you know that if you, you look at the population of patients who need a heart transplant, none of them survive beyond two years, right? So it's really a significant uh, improvement. And really at about one year, we're looking at about 89 or 90% of patients are still alive after transplant um, across the US. Um, now folks who have a second transplant, and that's the yellow line here, they don't do quite, quite as good as the first heart transplant, unfortunately, but still do relatively well compared to the alternative. And heart transplant has been around a long time actually. And so this is sort of just a brief history of um, some of the major milestones of heart transplantation. So, Back in 1967, actually, the first human heart transplant was performed by a guy named Christian Barnard. He was a surgeon in South Africa, and he came to the United States, actually, to learn from folks like uh, in uh, Norman Chumway, who's in the next picture uh, here at Stanford University, to learn the techniques about how to perform a human heart transplant. And because at the time, South Africa had different rules around sort of organ donation and the definition of brain death and so forth, he ended up being the first uh, surgeon to perform a human to human heart transplant in 1967. Now the patient didn't live very long, only a number of uh, days, but you know, it proved to the world that there was um, a possibility of success here and that you could transplant uh, one heart to another person and that they could live. In 1968, um, Norman Shumway uh, at Stanford University performed the first US heart transplant. Um, uh, and uh, he is really kind of, you know, thought of as sort of the father of, of U.S. heart transplantation. And Stanford has, you know, developed a lot of the um, kind of early techniques and methods that we use to, to, to um, take care of patients uh, who get transplants. And so we owe quite a lot to them. Although, interestingly enough, at that time, it was really controversial for him to have done this. You know, I think he was labeled as, you know, a murderer by a lot of people and things like this because he was taking a beating heart of, out of somebody and putting it into somebody new. 
And so there was really a lot of controversy around this. And for many years, sort of, there was a lot of, um, you know, disagreement over to over what, you know, defined an acceptable donor and so forth. And it really wasn't even actually until 1976 in California here that they came to a conclusion and a finalization legally, uh, sort of what defined a, 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 a um, uh, an acceptable donor. Um, in 1971, Stanford developed this sort of same technique that we use today to biopsy the heart um, after transplant to monitor for rejection. Um, in 1980, um, there was uh, a, a drug called cyclosporin, which is really um, what made solid organ transplant and all solid organ transplant really much more successful. Prior to this, we just gave steroids and you know, hope that everybody did okay, but steroids have a lot of problems, right? Um, but cyclosporin was a novel drug that allowed us to um, improve, uh, improve our outcomes in, in heart uh, transplant as well as other or solid organ transplant. Um, in uh, 1984, the first pediatric heart transplant was performed at Columbia University. Um, and then, you know, sort of jumping way ahead here, you know, things progressed between 1984 and 2011 in terms of the medications that we use for transplant and so forth, but the monitoring and the biopsies and all these things that were part of monitoring patients after transplant really was the same until 2011 when um, gene expression profiling for rejection monitoring was developed in something called an Alamap test. And this is a way for us to actually to monitor for rejection just through a simple blood test. So patients, you know, don't have to go through a biopsy, you know, where we put needles in their neck and, you know, go into their heart and take a piece of it. And there's always a possibility that we damage something, right, or kill them. And so it's really a, a, an amazing technique to sort of look at um, our body's response to, um, uh, you know, the, the possibility of rejection and looking at how white blood cells attack the heart. Um, and then in 2014, um, in Australia, uh, using some technique called ex vivo heart perfusion, which we'll talk about here also a little bit later, um, the first donor after, um, donor after cardiac death heart transplant uh, using this technology was performed. And Australia is a unique country in terms of its size and population. And so, you know, they have to travel significant distances to get donors because of the size of the country. And so trying to come up with novel ways to increase the, the, the rate of donors um, was important because up until this point, really most of our donors or actually all of our donors, I should say, uh, until uh, just recently in 2019, um, are brain death donors. So they, the heart is still beating at the time that they become um, uh, organs are harvested as opposed to um, deceased donor work, or excuse me, donors after cardiac death where the heart has stopped. And then in 2019, actually folks down the road from you all at Duke University um, performed the first US um, DCD donor heart transplant um, in December, 2019. So just before the pandemic hit, uh, we had the first uh, in the US um, use of this technology for that reason. So you think about a heart transplant, right? We have on the left here, we have our old heart. Old heart is big, it's boggy, it doesn't pump well, it's really sick. And if you look at that compared to the new heart or the donor heart on the right-hand side here, and apologize for the graphic nature of this picture, but um, to illustrate the fact that, you know, just look at the size of the heart, how healthy it looks, it's nice and pink, it doesn't look, you know, so, uh, so bad. And so that's a really a significant difference between the two things. But if we think about, you know, the number of people who have heart failure in the US, right? There are 650,000 people who are diagnosed with heart failure every year. And perhaps only 25,000 of those people are those who are sick enough to need um, consideration for advanced heart failure therapies. Again, most people don't progress to that degree, but there's a significant number. And if we're only doing about 3,500 heart transplants um, per year, um, that really only means that 15% of people or more, you know, or just give or take is going to be uh, eligible or receive a heart transplant. So what do we do with the rest of the people? Are there alternative treatments? Is there some way for us to increase the number of donors that we have in order to increase transplantation rates? So how do we help the other 85%? So the first goal is to just increase the number of donors, right? And I think compared to other types of organ transplant, the heart is um, much more, uh, you know, it's, it's much harder to find donors. And part of that has to do with the sort of unique qualities and um, the uh, susceptibility to lack of blood flow to the heart compared to other organs um, that make it uh, more difficult to travel longer distances to get donors, um, as well as, you know, so many people have cardiovascular disease that there are often uh, precluding factors to allow them to be acceptable donors. And you think about a kidney transplant, which I think this is always sort of a funny thing to talk to people about is that you can take a kidney from New York, take it out, put it in a box of ice and ship it by FedEx to California and we can do the transplant the next day. There's no way you can do that with a heart transplant. You have basically four hours 
to take the heart from a donor and bring it in uh, to the recipient and get it done. Over four hours increases your risk that the heart's not going to work when you when you finish the transplant. So really try and keep that amount of time to less than four hours. So that really limits your geographical area where you can find a donor. So we got to find other ways to get donors, right? So the first thing is, or can we use organs that were usually turned down? And there are a lot of organs that are turned down for various reasons. In fact, there's data that says that 60% of um, possible heart donors are turned down for various sort of reasons. One of those reasons commonly is something called hepatitis C, which is a, a viral infection, which everybody's probably heard of that causes liver disease. Um, and so using, you know, traditionally we would not accept donors that had hepatitis C because of the risk of giving hepatitis C to the recipient. Um, also thinking about donors after cardiac death, again, something that we haven't used or what's called an extended criteria donor. These are people who, um, you know, may have, you know, high, high, too many risk factors, maybe the distance is too far, they're a little bit older or something like there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't normally just, you know, sort of jump at it and take that donor for, for a patient. But this technology called ex vivo heart perfusion is uh, possibly a way for us to make extended criteria donors better donors, and then also allow us to um, you know, do donor after circulatory death or DCD. And then there's mechanical circulatory support, or as I mentioned before, pumps that are um, commercially available that uh, will assist the heart, like turbochargers for the heart, basically. Uh, there's even cardiac replacement therapy that replaces the heart. And we'll talk about these things here in a second. So when you think about hepatitis C, you know, traditionally this is a disease that's chronic, it causes cirrhosis, and it's something that, you know, folks um, are very aware of now, especially in sort of our um, more uh, baby boomer population, because it was very prevalent, you know, blood transfusion and so forth. And so, um, but what's great is that, you know, since 2014, we've had multiple antiviral medications that basically can cure hepatitis C in almost everybody. And so we're looking at over 95% cure rate with the current treatments that we had you know, previously was, you know, pretty dismal actually in terms of the things that we had to help people. But if you look back at the number of donor hearts that were taken in 2019, and this is from a registry by the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplant, you know, less than 2% of patients actually were hepatitis C positive um, that, uh, that, were don that were acceptable donors. But the idea is that we can now transplant hepatitis C heart and give treatment to the recipient and prevent the infection from ever coming to them, basically cure the infection, right? And so um, the first question is sort of, do people with hepatitis C donor hearts do as well as those who don't? And you know, I think at least preliminary, we're getting a lot of data here over the last couple of years, because this is becoming more and more popular that, um, that, these, uh, that these donors do just basically as well as those who, who are not. Um, and so what the treatment protocol typically is that we do the transplant and start medications right away. And you're actually able to prevent hepatitis C infection in the recipient. And so this potentially has a significant impact in the number of donors that we might be able to utilize now that we can cure this disease that was previously thought as un incurable. But really what I think is the most amazing thing is actually this technology or ex vivo heart perfusion. This is really, really cool to me. And Basically, the idea here is that you can perfuse the heart with blood flow and oxygen and optimize all the metabolism of the heart artificially while you're waiting to take that heart to somebody else. So you're basically optimizing the amount of time that the heart doesn't have any blood flow because that's the, that's the dangerous part, right? And again, I mentioned before, you only have four hours to get the heart from one place to the next, right, to be able to do it. But that's because the heart's not beating, the heart's not getting any blood flow, right? But if you can minimize the amount of time that that's happening, you could take a heart from you know, New York and bring it to California, right? Or vice versa, right? And so really expand the ability to take donors um, all over the country or even across the world potentially, right? Um, and so it also gives us an opportunity to sort of what we call rehab the heart, right? Where if you have this sort of you know, marginal heart because of whatever reason, can you give it some blood flow, let it wake up and see if the heart actually becomes a good quality donor so that someone could benefit from that, right? And that's sort of using it in the, in, in the evidence, uh, in the uh, uh, aspect of expanded criteria donors. And then again, DCD or where the heart has stopped, can we then take it out? Can we reanimate the heart, right? Allow it to recover from that injury and then transplant it in somebody, minimizing that you know, period of time where there's no blood flow. And really it's this sort of time, if the heart isn't cold, um, that uh, we really want to be careful of. So sort of what they call warm ischemic time where the heart is not um, at a very cold temperature uh, where the metabolism rate is very, very low. So traditionally what we do 
with a, an organ procurement for a heart basically is to inject some very cold preservation solution um, immediately and then cross plant the aorta, take the heart out, put it in ice so it stays very, very cold for as long as possible um, to sort of minimize the metabolic demand that the heart has um, and, uh, and bring it to the recipient. And so this device is called the organ care system and they actually have it uh, for multiple organs. They have it for livers, they have it for lungs and it's, it's in use for lungs and it's under trial for liver and heart transplants um, uh, for these uh, indications. And so this is again, a little bit of a graphic thing but I think it really illustrates what this is, right? You look at this, this is a beating heart outside the, outside the body, right? So you, we call it the heart in a box basically. And you can turn all these dials and all this stuff that we have here to make it completely normal physiologic parameters. It's really unbelievable. Um, the first time I saw this, I, it blew my mind, right? I mean, uh, that you could reanimate a heart, take it to somewhere else and put it in somebody. And so again, along the lines of this in 2019 in December at Duke performed the first DCD heart donor. And this picture here is um, Dr. Schroeder and Dr. Carmelo Milano down at, uh, at Duke um, who really have pioneered um, the use of this technology. And this has a potential to expand our donor pool by 30%, right? So that's a significant number of people that uh, could help, right? Then on the other hand of things, I say, is there something other than transplant that we can do to help these people, right? And so that takes us to mechanical circulatory support. And there has been forever a very, you know, interest in developing artificial hearts, right? Do we really need um, a, a physiologic heart, right? Can we use some kind of technology to assist or replace the heart? And as far back as really actually like in the late 1960s, and this is, you know, a famous story in medicine where Denton Cooley and Michael DeBakey were two surgeons in uh, Houston, Texas, which is sort of this famous cardiac surgery rivalry, right? Where the, the first artificial heart was actually uh, implanted by Denton Cooley at the Texas Heart Institute, or what became the Texas Heart Institute. And, you know, he took this heart out of the lab without permission of DeBakey and put it in a patient because who was dying, right? In an experimental manner. And uh, then that's how they kind of, you know, started to, uh, uh, to have this famous rivalry where the two institutions at Baylor and, and Texas Heart became um, uh, big rivals. But Jarvik, you know, is the name that everyone's heard about, you know, probably from the early 1980s when the first heart came out. The Thoratec, uh, or what now is, is owned by Abbott, but um, this paracorporeal guy, these are external pumps that pump blood. And actually CPMC, where I work in San Francisco, the person who designed this pump was this, the person who actually um, uh, started our program, a guy named Donald Hill. And he started the Thoratec Corporation and we use their devices now. Um, and then we moved from pulsatile devices, um, which are the Novacor and then the HeartMate XVE, but it was really this HeartMate XVE, this sort of HeartMate One, that proved to us that mechanical um, support was actually something that was viable for patients, right? This showed that it was significantly better to give a VAD to somebody than to just treat them with medications. Um, but we moved from sort of pulsatile flow where the heart, where an artificial heart will pump and, and pump blood, right? To something called continuous flow where the blood flow is all the time, right? So it's a, it's a rotor that basically pumps blood um, throughout the body continuously, there's no pulse, right? So these are people that you feel their wrist, they don't have a pulse. You can't check their blood pressure in the normal manner because again, that relies on um, squeezing of the heart, right? And there's a bunch of different things that have come down the line and we're really on sort of the third generation of pumps or the heart made three at this point. And really the goals of mechanical assisted circulation are sort of twofold, right? You're either looking at short-term support for somebody or long-term support. So short-term support, trying to help them either recover their heart function, you know, if they have some sort of inflammatory condition of the heart that they're gonna get better and then maybe you'll take the pump out, right? That's a very small um, percentage of people. Or, you know, trying to make people who are really, really sick better candidates for transplant, right? So I think that there's always this balance that people are too sick or, um, you know, to, to go through a transplant surgery. So this was a way for us to rehab them, right? Buy them time to get stronger, get their nutrition status better, you know, functional ability and make them a better, um, uh, a better heart transplant candidate. But also heart transplants are, you know, they come by when they come by, right? And so some people don't have time to wait. And so we also used to try and help buy them time until something that's acceptable for them uh, is available. But also, for people who are not candidates for transplants. And there's a lot of reasons why that would be, you know, maybe you've had cancer, maybe you're too old, maybe you have other, you know, uh, conditions that would make you not do well with a transplant, but you still, you know, are not ready to die from heart failure, right? So this is permanent treatment or something we call destination therapy for people. 
And we've really moved from the first, second, now all the way to the third generation of pumps. And we've made you know, significant technological advancements. And it's amazing. You look at this only from 2008, right? It's not that long ago that we've been doing these kinds of things. Really, artificial hearts have been available for a very long time, but really the successful pump was once we moved to a continuous flow and that allowed the pump to be smaller. It was silent. It doesn't make any noise, basically that you can hear in the room. Previously, you would hear this clicking or, you know, um, lots of noise, you know, associated with the pulsatility of the pump, right? There was, you know, any number of problems with strokes or bleeding or infections and things associated with those pumps. But as we started to make them smaller, and you can see that they're basically the, now the size of the palm of your hand, and they're implanted into the heart. They take blood out of the main pumping chamber of the heart called the left ventricle, run it through this pump and deliver it back into what's called the aorta, which is the main outflow of the heart. But again, they require some peripheral equipment, a batteries to run it, you know, you have to be connected to power. And there's a, what's called a drive line, which is an external part. So there is still some external component to it, but the, the pumping mechanism and everything is on the inside. And just to kind of illustrate what, what we're talking about here, you know, the, um, the continuous flow technology. So what we see here is that from the left ventricle or the main pumping uh, chamber of the heart, this is the heart mate too. And this is what's called axial flow. So it's in line with blood flow. So blood would come from the pumping chamber of the heart, run through the pump and then get delivered to the body as opposed to what's called centrifugal flow where it's perpendicular to blood flow, right? So you have blood flow from the left ventricle or the pumping chamber of the heart gets pumped into the pump. You have this rotor that spins and pumps the blood basically into the, um, into the, uh, the body. And so that really you know, has allowed things to miniaturize. Um, also nowadays there's lots of magnets inside this and the current device that we use is fully levitated with magnets. So there's no friction basically between the pump and the, and the, pump, it's the pump rotor and the pump itself. And that's important because that you know, minimizes damage to blood cells and so forth, which can cause uh, issues like uh, stroke or blood clots. And then there's this, you know, the Jarvik heart, right? Which is what everybody's heard about, um, you know, uh, in the past, this has become now something called the syncardia total artificial heart, right? And this is cardiac replacement therapy. This is, you know, we actually take the heart out and we replace both pumping chambers of the heart with artificial pumping chambers and connect it to the blood vessels in the body. Um, this is a pulsatile device. It has four mechanical valves inside of it and it's big and it's noisy and it's only used to treat people who are waiting for transplant has quite a lot of risk involved with it. And where I did my um, transplant fellowship, we did a lot of these at, at Cedar sinai but it's very kind of um, not, uh, it's a very uh, niche sort of um, treatment, I would say, and, and not a lot of places that do it. In your locale at VCU, um, they actually do quite a lot of this in, in Richmond. Um, but you can see down here on the bottom right, this, this was what used to, this thing called Big Blue, that was what took to power this thing, right? So you couldn't leave the hospital with that thing. That weighs 400 pounds, right? So you couldn't really take anybody anywhere. So they were never allowed to leave the hospital. But about probably seven or eight years ago, they came out with something called the Freedom Driver, which is what's right next to it. And that actually allowed patients to be discharged with this device. And um, I believe it was in, uh, in Arizona that they discharged the first patient from the hospital uh, with this device. But really all in all, what we're trying to do is maximize benefit, right? And minimize risk to people with these types of devices because these are mechanical things, right? If there's interaction between blood and the mechanical parts that cause a lot of problems for people, we want to both maximize the benefit by improving their quality of life. We wanna improve their functional ability. We wanna get them back to living, right? That's the goal, right? Get people back to you know, doing the things that they do, playing golf, traveling. You know, you can't swim with these things, but you know, we have, have a patient who went on a cruise to the Panama, this is all pre-pandemic, obviously, right? Cruise to the Panama Canal, went to New Zealand, went to Canada to visit his family. I mean, living a life where he could barely do anything, he couldn't walk to the bathroom without feeling terrible, right? And now he's off, you know, helping take care of his grandkids and so forth. So it's really, it's amazing that what you can do with these things for people who otherwise aren't candidates for transplant. Um, we want to make people live longer and we want to make them better candidates for transplant. But these all comes with a cost, right? We have to minimize risk of infection. There's external things, you know, there's bacteria on the skin that can infect the pump and it's hardware and bacteria like to stick to that stuff. Um, bleeding is a bigger problem because they're on blood thinners in order to, to have these devices and then stroke again because of blood clots that can form inside the pump um, or other forms of, of clotting. That may cause the pump to malfunction. But they really work. And this is um, data from the most recent um, LVAN trial, which is the HeartMate 3 or Momentum 3 trial. And this, 
is the, the device that we implant here and we do about 30 of them a year or so. And this is um, really the best technology that's been out there in this field. It has improved the amount of people that can live. It has minimized complications related to it, stroke rate, you know, clots in the pump that you have to take it out, um, things like that. So if you're comparing the sort of old technology, the HeartMate 2 versus the HeartMate 3, which is done in this study, much better with the HeartMate 3. And so if you compare it to people who just got treated with medication, and this is from a trial called Rematch, which was the HeartMate 1, right, where we looked at at that time, there was no option, right? It was either you weren't a transplant candidate, you got the VAD, or you got medications. How did people do? And the outcomes are so bad. No one's ever going to repeat that trial, right? No one's ever going to compare it to medication. They're only going to compare it from bad to bad. And that's because at 12 months, again, 24% of people were alive compared to 88% now, right? So that's a huge improvement. And you look at two years, 8% versus over 80%, right? So it is a significant improvement in patients' um, survival. And they feel better, right? Patients are doing better. They're outliving life. They're, you know, doing things that they couldn't do for years because they were crippled by heart failure, right? And, you know, this is one of the things that we look at is something called a six minute walk test, which is a very simple thing. You just have people walk back and forth for six minutes. That's where it gets its name, right? It's kind of silly, but it is a really important functional marker for us. And so, in the people that were included in this trial, you know, at baseline, people could only walk about 165 yards at uh, in six minutes. So for your golfers out there, right, that's a par three. It probably doesn't take you six minutes to walk from the tee to the green, right? So that's pretty slow and not very much, right? But once they got the van, by the time they got up, you know, recovered from surgery, they were doing two times that, right? They were walking, you know, three, four football fields without having to stop, right? And so it really is an improvement. And if again, you look at the number of pa you know, patients who had really significant symptoms, right? Um, we look at the New York Heart Association functional class here again, you know, class one and two being no or no symptoms at all, that's class one or class two being, you know, really sort of no symptoms of regular activity, only sort of really exerted exertional activity. At baseline, there wasn't anybody who was that good, right? Everybody had symptoms, but by the time you got to three, six, 12 months, you know, all the way out there, most people felt really good and had very little symptoms. So it really does improve your functional ability and it reduces symptoms. So people feel better, they're out living their life, you know, and they are, um, they are, you know, really doing well. And so it's really uh, revolutionized the treatment for people um, with heart failure. But the problem still lies in the fact that we have external stuff, right? If you ask people who have these, what is the thing that they hate the most, right? Carrying the batteries around, they're heavy, they don't like having the controller, they look, you know, there's, you know, people who are out there now who make, you know, clothing and things to kind of conceal everything and all that stuff is great, but, you know, people still would rather not have the external stuff. And so there's been a lot of interest in trying to figure out how do we power this device with something that's all the way inside the body, right? And, you know, we think about your cell phone, right? You can charge your cell phone without plugging into a, a cord now, right? But um, there isn't something like that for, for um, you know, these pumps per se. But so there's a company that's come out, and it's an Israeli, I believe an Israeli company that has designed a, uh, basically a wireless charging battery that can allow people to have complete, you know, freedom from any external components for like six or eight hours. So there's basically a coil that gets placed around side, inside the lung. There's a battery that's internal to the, to the body. And then there's some external equipment that, you know, basically um, transmits electricity to charge the battery. Uh, between the two um, the two devices, right? And so with that, people can take all this stuff off. They have no drive line, nothing external, and they can walk around for up to six to eight hours potentially uh, without being tied to a battery or cord. And if you ask people, you know, that doesn't seem great, you know, you're not doing it 24 hours a day, but if you ask the VAD patient if he could, you know, spend six or eight hours without being attached to something, they would jump on it in a second. And so you know, I think this is probably the most important thing that's going to change um, with our uh, treatment in this uh, in this population here in the next couple of years. And so these things are under clinical trial. They they have had you know two patients um, that have been implanted with this device, as far as I know, maybe more now, but uh, two that at least I'm aware of, um, and they've done well and they're happy. So in conclusion, heart failure is a chronic condition, right, with a rapidly expanding population of patients that we really need to figure out how to help. And advanced heart failure, unfortunately, carries a very poor prognosis if you don't do something advanced to help people. 
Um, heart transplant, you know, still is the gold standard for treatment of patients with end stage heart disease, but there really are significant limitations to donor availability that inhibits access. Um, there are lots of contraindications to transplant and so forth. And so there are a lot of reasons why that's not the best option for people. Mechanical circulatory support, on the other hand, offers, you know, patients with end stage heart failure, um, improved quality of life, increased length of life, um, and either waiting for, as they wait for transplant or, or as an alternative treatment. And so I just want to thank everybody again for the opportunity to chat today. And, um, you know, I am really proud to be an alumni from Roanoke College. I, I think my time at Roanoke and within the science departments of biology and biochemistry really, you know, set the stage for my success. And I owe a lot to the mentorship and um, close personal relationships that you develop at Roanoke, which I think is what makes Roanoke unique, right, uh, compared to other places I have been and other universities. Um, and, you know, I will always carry that with me, you know. Um, forever. And I am, you know, really indebted to the school. And so I think elevating the sciences here at Roanoke is, um, is really just an outstanding thing. And, you know, we're, we have a campaign going to, to rebuild the science center to help, um, you know, really have top-notch facilities for students to help them grow and become um, outstanding scientists and physicians and, you know, all folks within the health sciences and, and, and sciences, right? Um, here's a picture of Dr. Jorgensen and myself, and this just, a, you know, an, an attestation to the sort of lifelong friendship and mentorship that you get from people here. You know, he officiated my wedding actually back in 2012. And so uh, really was just an outstanding opportunity. So I think, you know, again, Roanoke is a, new, a unique place and I'm, I'm super proud to be a part of it. And so thank you. So, so thank you, Jared, that was awesome. Really appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, we have a uh, we have a few questions so far. If uh, if you have questions, please feel free to submit them if you haven't already. I'm going to go ahead and, and work through these. Um, so we, our first question is from from Tess Weidenkamp. She's a student here. Um, a uh, I think Tess is a junior. Um, she she asks how much are heart ailments due to genetic factors versus lifestyle factors. So I think that's a that's a good question. Um, I think that um, heart failure uh, and just in cardiac conditions in general, um, you know, I think that um, you know genetics do play a significant portion into that. You know, in terms of predisposition to things like high cholesterol or coronary artery disease and so forth. Um, but you know, a lot of it is also lifestyle. You know, managing high, high blood pressure, high, you know, high fat diets and so forth. So I think both of them are equally important. Um, you know pure genetic conditions that cause congestive heart failure and stuff like that are, are far less common than, you know, uh, uncontrolled high blood pressure or coronary artery disease, which are the two most common reasons in the United States at this point. Um, and so uh, all of those things are, are very important, but um, that answers the question. Great. Um, so our next question is from Dar Jorgensen. Um, he wants to know how long will an OCS heart remain viable? So that is a good question. So um, the answer to that is unknown. Um, and so there have been um, document, documented um, utilization of uh, hearts, I believe just like 600 minutes. Um, so, you know, a number of hours basically um, before you uh, transplant the heart, but I think it's not yet known. Yeah. So but what's good about it is that you can monitor all of the things that you'd want to know physiologically if the heart is going bad, basically, you know, monitoring the metabolism of the heart and all this stuff, you know, during that. It's just, it's, it blows my mind that we can do that. It's really amazing. So, so our next question is from um, Scott Segerstrom, who I think uh, was, was he your RA advisor? He was, he is. <laughs> So he says, Jared, is there much involvement with medical ethics boards in the modern development or use of these devices in science? So, yes, I think that uh, the one thing I really um, enjoy about being a heart failure cardiologist is that uh, we really are a multidisciplinary management system. You know, I think these are complicated decisions. Um, you know, we, we uh, partner with, you know, folks like social work, parts like psych uh, folks like psychiatrists, um, you know, we have nurses, we have, um, you know, physical therapists, pharmacists, everybody who puts their input into sort of helping select patients that are appropriate uh, for this. But yes, I think ethics is a significant um, part of that in certain situations as well. And I think certainly in the history of heart transplant, a big, big, big deal when it came to sort of 
defining what's, you know, an acceptable donor, right? What is, what is um, natural death basically, right? And what constitutes death, which is, you know, I think in all organ transplant, that's been an issue, but yes, they're, they're very involved in all these things. So. so our next question is again from Dar. Um, he said he's interested in the, the cost for a year of uh, a VAD. So, so let's say someone has it for a year, what's that total cost for them? And does insurance cover it? So uh, insurances do cover this, um, you know, it's covered by Medicare, uh, which means, you know, private payers pay for it uh, as well. Um, so, and, you know, depend upon the plan, you know, how much, you know, is covered and what's not. But one of the things that we do, because they're, they're very costly, and I'll get to the number here, and then it'll probably surprise everybody. But, um, you know, one of the things that we do as part of the evaluation is make sure that there's adequate financial coverage for people, because we know that it's a major burden. Um, but, you know, up uh, you know, the current pumps cost about 50 to $60,000 just for the pump, right? So, and then you're talking about the hospitalization and the surgery just for the index. Hospitalization, um, you know, provided they weren't hospitalized for a long period of time. I mean, you're looking at half a million dollars, right? Um, over the course of a year, I don't know how that number off the top of my head, but, you know, between um, hospital rehospitalizations and stuff like that, it's, it's considerable. But, what has been shown is that, uh, and actually recently, there was a published paper a couple of years ago that looked at the cost effectiveness of VADs. And it, even if you you factor in the, all the rehospitalizations for people with heart failure, it actually still, even though it's expensive, it's still uh, cost effective to do this. Um, and then sort of thinking of cost of the OCS. So I've seen estimates anywhere between 25 and $40,000 per use of that device. So it's not cheap, um, you know, an organ, transplant is, is very expensive. Again, you're looking at close to a million dollars. So, Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is from Karen Winslow. Um, are you aware of any drug trials in the U.S. for, and I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly, pimobendin? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but I'm not, I'm not that familiar with it. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that pharmaceutical. Um, it must be, a, I imagine it's a blood thinner. Yeah. Uh, Question from Chris Lassiter. Um, are there any physiological effects in the body to the continuous flow blood versus the normal pumping? That's a really, uh, a really great question. And yes. And so, you know, I think this idea, you know, the body was designed to be pulsatile, right? I mean, the heart pumps for a reason and that sort of change in pressure in the vasculature, right, is really important. And so what we did notice that when we move from pulsatile flow to continuous flow, that there was a lot of, um, you know, uh, a lot of things in regards to sort of the sheer force on the blood vessels that cause problems. So the sort of main sort of two or three things that we think about. So one is actually developing abnormal blood vessels within the GI tract, which leads to bleeding. And so these are, we call AV malformations, right? That are sort of very friable blood vessels. And so one of the common problems is that people have, you know, blood loss from the GI tract because of it. Um, there's also, um, because of the chewing of blood through the pump, right? There's something, there's this disease called von Willebrand's disease, which basically, um, you know, makes you have a higher tendency to bleed. And so there's this concept of acquired von Willebrand's disease that um, makes you have a higher tendency to bleed. So it's those combination of two things that are, are problematic. Um, now, the HeartMate 3 or the more current pump, right, actually has an artificial pulse to it, which is, I, I don't know, and I haven't seen any data on this, whether or not that's caused a significant difference because you, you know, the GI bleeding rate is actually pretty similar, but um, I think the bigger thing there is that it's more tolerant to having lower intensity anticoagulation possibly. And I think that obviously um, is contributory to um, the bleeding rates and so forth. So um, I think we're still learning about the physiology, but yeah, no, for sure. There's, uh, there's definitely, your body was made in a particular way for a reason, right? And we change that, it's not, it's not gonna be normal. All right, th and thanks to Chris Lasseter for answering that question because I wanted to ask that one. Um, I've got an anonymous question here. Uh, how do you feel your Roanoke education prepared you for your position today? Also a great question. And, and like I mentioned before, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, Roanoke is really a special place and is very near and dear to my heart for a lot of reasons. And um, I, I think that, you know, what I um, got from my education at Roanoke was both good, high quality teaching and really, really good close mentorship and personal relationships that you build with faculty and your friends and stuff like that. I mean, just, it doesn't really exist as easily in, in larger institutions. And I think that the, 
you know, the educators at Roanoke really care about their students. And, um, you know, I think having that personalized um, education was so important. And I think I felt very confident in what I had learned and my abilities and, you know, that I always had somebody I could ask a question to and, and, and get better and strive to improve. So um, I think from, from that standpoint, really sort of, you know, strong personal relationship and mentorship that was um, what was probably the most important thing. So. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a question from Jack Steeler here. Um, it's about costs of treatments, but it's about more, more broadly. Can you comment on the costs of the various treatments? Maybe talk to us about what you feel is most cost effective? Well, certainly medications, right, are the most cost effective thing. And so I think that's, you know, one of the biggest issues with heart failure is sort of preventing hospitalizations. Hospitalizations are really expensive, right? And so we're talking, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases. And hospital hospitalization rate in heart failure is very high, actually. And the re-hospitalization rate is very high. And it's actually a marker of when people are doing not as well, right? And so when someone gets um, admitted to the hospital because of their heart failure, it uh, it really is a marker to us that things are worse, right? And their survival goes way down and, and so forth. And so, you know, making sure that we have good cost-effective medications that are tried and true and proven to help people is really important. Um, some of these medications are pretty expensive, um, but most of them are widely available and they're, um, you know, very effective. So trying to minimize that uh, is important, but, you know, I think, for some people, cost of certain medications, maybe thousands of dollars a year, you know, I think most of these are, you know, covered by insurances and so forth. And, you know, for those people who don't have health insurance, a lot of the really good ones have been around for so long, they're generic, so they can be pretty cheap. Um, defibrillators are expensive, you know, I mean, they're again, thousands of dollars in each one of those things, you know, and then the cost of, you know, changing the battery and so forth. So they're not, you know, but all these things are, are if you have insurance, they're covered um, typically now. Um, but you know, I think that uh, overall the cost of care for heart failure patients is incredibly high. And most of that is hospitalization rate. And so really trying to focus on that. Um, and the reason I brought up remote hemodynamic monitoring is actually we have all of these programs that we use to try and monitor people once they get hospitalized and go home to try and keep them from coming back because we know that's a bad thing, right? Unfortunately, all of these things like checking your weight, calling us if you feel bad, like, you know, blood pressure and all that stuff, Unfortunately, none of those things in clinical trial ever been shown to do anything, you know, even though we know that they're important. But the only thing that has been shown to help is this remote monitor, this CardioMEMS device, basically, that we have an eyeball on people every single day based on how they're doing, and we can prevent them from getting back into the hospital. So that is really, I think, a, a significant, um, a significant um, uh, improvement. So I hope okay, that sort okay. of answers your question, but it's very expensive. Everything is very expensive. <laughs> So I, I have one, one last question here um, from a pre-med student I'm not familiar with. So Sally, um, you should come talk to me, uh, but what <laughs> advice would you give to a current student who's considering pursuing a career path in medicine? Good question. Um, so I think, yes, the first answer would be go talk to Dr. Johan. <laughs> but uh, no, I think that um, for me, you know, I think medicine um, is really just a very rewarding field. And, you know, I think you really get the opportunity to um, to touch people's lives in a way that you may not elsewhere. And um, especially in dealing with sort of very sick patients who have end stage disease. Um, so my advice is to, uh, one is, is to do some volunteer work, right. And see if this is really right for you, because it is, you know, it's a serious commitment and, you know, try and, and see if, you know, living this life and, and doing this type of thing is, is what you want. Um, I think that um, you're in a great place at Roanoke to get the right kind of guidance on how to become a physician. Um, talk to as many people as you can about it and don't talk to the ones that are really old because they're going to tell you not to do it. Talk to the ones that are younger who love it still, you know, so it's, um, I, uh, I think um, what I would do is, is, is work as hard as you can, you know, absorb as much as you can, um, see as much of it, uh, uh, as you can in your time uh, in college and then, and then make your decision from there. Okay, with that, thank you very much. I think we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up. Uh, so th thank you, Jared, and thank you to everybody who joined us today for this Note Live event. Uh, on behalf of the college, I invite you to join us for our upcoming Note Live events. 
On Wednesday, March 3rd at noon, we'll talk with Dr. Todd Peppers about his new book of Courtiers and Princes. Then on Wednesday, March 10th, we'll host the third installment of our series from Washington, D.C. on healthcare with Rodney Whitlock, who's from the class of 1987. That event's at 7.30 p.m. And then on Friday, March 12th at noon, join us for Noak Live, The Art of Your Story and Why It Matters. Um, if you want more information, please visit www.roanoke.edu slash alumni and visit the Alumni Hub. There you can find links to upcoming and past Noak Live events. Thank you, everybody, and stay well. Thank you, everybody.